So it sounds like you are on a full course of antibiotics by the sounds of the email. Oh, yes. Um, every morning, one full gram of a very nasty, very powerful line, which is notorious for giving diarrhea. Mm, fun. Here's the, the problem is that it's not typical cellulite. It, it's caused by a specific streptococcus. Mm. And the, there's a bunch of interesting aspect to it. Like um, there's a subset of CFS patients who have a who seems to have streptococcus auroras because in the study in Sweden where they had a, a, a streptococcus auroras vaccination for a while and it was causing remissions. Hmm. Um, so that's basically ongoing. So, so it's going nicely. I go and I measure my lake temperature every day and it's still about seven degree difference between the infected lake and not infected lake. Interesting, okay. So, but that's basically for um, comfort to review to probably going to be asking for give me more antibiotics. Because the goal is to get rid of the, what I suspect now are residues infections, which is why I've had this three times in the last four years. Well, I'm sorry you're going through that. Hopefully it gets uh, figured out, but. Oh, I... no, it, but this way, it's this last time was informative because it, it, expla it explains a couple of minor issues, which didn't quite make sense. Now it all does. I tend mm -hmm. to be a mongrel, so I like to get all the information fitting together nicely, and then, then I'm happy. Otherwise I keep looking for answers. Okay, right. let's shut up and get on with. Yeah, uh, I hope you've been uh, monitoring that with all the stool tests and stuff and uploading to see what the. It, okay, um, the turnaround time for stool test tests is too long. It's three to four weeks. Yeah. However, what I did was I looked up, took my last stool test, looked up this particular antibody, which I do have in my database. I have a large number of them. And then see how to compensate for it. So it told me certain things like navy beans, lots of beans, no vitamin Bs. Reservatol, et cetera. So I've simply gone over a certain specific um, probiotic. So basically I just went over the fat and no diarrhea. Awesome. Because it, I'm basically uh, compensating ahead of time, which is sweet. It just sort of, it, and it works. Yeah, cool stuff. All okay. right, yeah, let's jump back into the conversation for the today, which is about some, a couple different people that reached out to you uh, in regards to having long haul symptoms after uh, being exposed to COVID-19. Yeah. Um, so. I'd love to hear your uh, kind of introduction to these two different people. You can choose whichever one fascinates you more. Um, kind of give a background as to how they got in touch with you and kind of some of the symptoms that they were struggling with. Background is probably six months ago, eight months ago, I was invited by a friend who I know from um, chronic fatigue syndrome thing to a Facebook private long haul public group. And I have occasionally posted, sometimes administrator tossed it away and sometimes not. But what happened was a couple of them got through and finally somebody in that group went and she so comically mentioned, finally, after a year, I went and did a microbiome test results. Um, she happens to be a trained as economist, well-trained in statistics, et cetera. So uh, it was interesting doing hers because we ended up having a dialogue back and forth about the results and explanations and issues dealing with it, which, which was nice because often I'm not, having, not able to have a um, conversation with people reasonably skilled in the statistical skills, which I tend to use a lot. So she went in and submitted her thing. As I was just finishing her report, somebody else mentioned, hey, I have long COVID, I just uploaded my results, here to do analysis. So the two of them came back to back. One took me about a week to go through. And when she sent in, um, her results, it was interesting because a study had just been done, which is, um, uh, okay, that's, I'm gonna share, attempt to share screen if I can. Oh, can you need to enable screen sharing? Yeah. I'm just gonna pause this for a second. Right screen. And what we have here is a bit from one of the blog posts, which is long COVID, like my analysis of the section. Um, and the first thing was to summarize what has been published dealing with COVID and long haul, actually COVID and the microbiome alone. So it's something which I've been watching constantly because I expect some people to do it. Most of the people I expect to be coming from is from China, which seems to be much more aggressive doing microbiome research on conditions. Um, so one study which was fascinating was that the microbiome before COVID determines the severity. And that's because the, the Chinese happen to have a large sample of people which they pre-tested everybody's microbiome. So when a percentage came down with microbiome with COVID, they did analysis and said, hey, wait a minute, this is a subset that could predict the severity, which was sort of interesting because it means there is an ability to do risk analysis ahead of time if you want to get hold of the data and pre-test people ahead of time, which probably would be a challenge in this country. But the Chinese fortunately did it because that gave us confirmation that the severity that the microbiome and COVID has impact from the very beginning. In other words, certain microbiome shifts cause, cause a severe COVID, others may be asymptomatic, which is nice. Our study shows that the um, that basically between infected and uninfected controls and that symptom severity corresponded with, with specific microbiome tax. In other words, how bad it is depends on how the microbiome shifts. Again, to me, not surprising is what I was expecting from my basic model I've been using for probably five to six years dealing with ME, uh, with MACFS or with IBS or a whole bunch of other 
foggy conditions where you have a multi large number of symptoms and no clear understanding of the causality. So this lovely study was sweet because it sort of confirmed exactly what my suspicions were. Now, the study also had a sweet chart. Actually, it's loaded with information. The link is there, but the link showing is there, which is comparison before and after. After 38 days, I think it's 38 days after diagnosis, which means in theory, by conventional medicine, they fully recovered, right? Because COVID lasted about 14 days. Wait a minute, uh, take a look at the microbiome shifts before and after. Again, they had the microbiomes prior to COVID. Look at it afterwards. Look at all of that pink. Yeah, could you talk us through what these different colors mean? Okay, the, the pink is basically, uh, give me a second, um, is um, bacteroids and the ground is firmicules and the lovely um, blue is protobacteria, which basically explodes after infection. And then the yellow, which is very common, is there is ancient bacteria. Uh, so a bunch of things have gotten, or 38 days or more after infections, way out of normal. In other words, the gut has not come back to normal. Okay, that happens to be exactly the model which I have for, which I've used for a whole variety of analysis. And there, so basically it was there. And then we went in and actually looked at the person's symptoms and the symptoms are, oops, okay, let me get my scrolling working a little bit better. Uh, person had COVID in March, 2020. So that's, they have had long COVID for over a year now. They attacked the cardiac originally. Um, it stopped when it went back to H1 blocker severe constipation and they've been going on for a year. A sudden break in constipation for six months and then it came back. Uh, ongoing symptoms with pains, parts of the body, sex life is hampered. Okay, not too surprising there. Um, and then she goes on and describes some of the other things she's been trying to do. Okay, um, basically I then went through and in terms of the bacteria identified in the study as getting whacked, she had 34 matches. That is, where the study reports, these people are generally too high, she is too high, considerably too high, too low, too low. In other words, her profile matches that reported from the literature, which I always deem to be a good thing because it means, okay, we're not getting, we are confirming the model applies to a specific patient. The study applies to a specific person, which is always something I try to do if possible, rather than the expedited medical approach is, oh, let's assume it is and go with it. So, um, okay, then walk through different things. I have a whole bunch of um, ways which I use the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Gene and Genomics on the microbiome sample to calculate things and to calculate it oddities or shifts where things are, are up. One of which was there are three end products which were out of range. One was vitamin D as in too low. And then, so I said, okay, let's see if there's anything in the literature on. I usually like whenever I find an oddity to see if the literature confirms it. Sure. And yeah. the case of vitamin D, um, we find that there, and we find that not only does vitamin D comes into infection, but it, uh, it, it impacts cardiac, um, the um, the heart aspects and also uh, impacts cholesterol buildup, all of which were things she had observed. In other words, the keg analysis says, okay, these are things you are too low on um, in terms of what the gut is producing, not necessarily what the blood test would produce, but what the gut is producing. And she looked at it and said, okay, yeah, and she's going to up her dosage. Um, she was doing something like, I think a thousand I use per day, and my suggestion was at least ten thousand. Then I gave a link over to study showing what studies have been used, what dosages have been used in variety of clinical studies, so that she can reference that and say, okay, this dosage is not going off off the rails. This is a dose which has been used in clinical studies before. So just uh, to preface. So she gets the uh, this test done through one of the sites for the microbiome. And she uploads it to your site and notices that there's certain trends in her microbiome that are not favorable based right. on the research that it's linked to. And some yeah. of these are suggesting that she could have potentially low vitamin D, although it's not shown in the blood, 
It, it may or may not, not be. Um, she never indicated if she had a blood test result for it. Okay. And vitamin D is a real troublesome measurement because the labs always do it based on the local folks. So if you are in Panama, the range could be very different than if you are in Juneau, Alaska. Sure. And so, there's many different forms of vitamin D blood tests to be performed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So vitamin D is problematic if you don't know the details. For example, it's talking about 125D, and 125D is something I'm very familiar with because with MACFS, usually it goes sky high. My last relapse um, persuaded the doctor to give me the test for it because it's not, an, not a normal test. The lab double tested because the first results were so high they figured the lab equipment was funky and it got the same results. And then, in subs then as treatment progresses successfully, the 1 to 5D levels started dropping, 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 got back down to normal range. So for, for me specifically, it was is a good predictor of the, the state of MECFs when, when I have had a relapse. So it's, again, for me personally, a particular indicator which works well. Okay, um, I love the other things, bacteria products out of the range. Uh, every single thing out of range was too low. Bacteria products are troublesome because they are difficult to supplement. Um, they are often complex chemicals not available as a supplement. Cake module, nothing reported was not that one. And again, enzymes out of range, every single one of 48 was low. Having that number being out of range is unusual, it's atypical. So in other words, a whole bunch of chemicals which normally are being produced by the microbiome ain't being produced. Which means that if the metabolites going into your body are totally jacked, the whole your body is going to respond in 101 different ways because it's in some cases in general it's being starved of essential chemicals, which of course makes it a bit of a challenge to correct. So cake suggestions, um, which particularly comes out of enzymes, ended up having two so two things are calculated. These two probiotics are ones to produce some of the missing enzymes, and which is. Uh, Colostrum pretericum and Bifidos antolescens or Bifidos longum or Bifidos animus. All three, either one of the three produces the enzymes which are um, she's low in according to the cake analysis and these are probiotic species bacteria which produces those missing enzymes. In other words, we are doing a bioactive supplement We're simply because we cannot get those missing enzymes as a pre-prepared capsules. Instead, we are actually feeding in the bacteria that produces them to try mitigating symptoms of therapy. Okay, so the next thing I, I went down, I looked at supplement suggestions, which goes and um, spells out things, again, from the missing products, etc. Items which are available, keywords, somewhere in the world as a supplement, which are having low production rates. In theory, again, by supplementing it, you are going to better restore the body, the body balance by having the, the chemicals which are being underproduced being supplied as a supplement. Interesting. So yeah, so for people that are listening in, I'm just going to list off all the things that she was showing low in and, and that needed supplementing. We have beta alanine, D ribose, iron, L histidine, L lysine, L phenylalanine, L tryptophan, and magnesium. So a lot of these are precursors to energy production at its root, like literally creating ATP, yeah. um, as well as dopamine and serotonin, uh, mm -hmm. which would be shown with the L-phenylalanine and the L-tryptophan. Um, so a lot of these would make sense with uh, this person uh, having a lot of issues with energy production. Um, sex drive seemed to be diminished drastically, which is very much linked to overall energy and hormonal health, but also you know dopamine levels in the body. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting to see this uh, as the list. Yeah, and all these are calculated, be, believe it or not, from genes in the bacteria she has. Interesting, very so cool. It, so it's, it's truly a novel approach. Um, and um, so it's just sort of, okay, it's a novel approach, it's strictly experimental, but so far the feedback we've gotten is it has been surprisingly effective. Okay, so next was checking against profile, et cetera. And what I did was I took the um, bacteria, which he, with the, okay, the, there's one study with active COVID and there's the other study with COVID after 48 days. So we have two sets of studies. One is active COVID, the one is long haul COVID. So I went down and enumerate the bacteria shifts and whether or not um, she had a matching shifts. 
So in other words, matching them at all. Um, now here we're, here's where we hit ongoing interesting challenges. One is often we have something like it's high. If you have a population of people with COVID or any condition and a healthy control, and you do a study and the results may say that people with COVID have a statistically significant higher average number. It may be that it's only 5% higher on average, but it's statistically significant, which means you're not talking about very high, you're just talking about moderately high, which of course makes it a little bit of a problem if you're looking at the number. Oh, well, I mean, you just said the 65 percentile. No, it's not a problem. Uh, it depends on how you run the, the data and what your assumptions are. So what I've done across the top is I put KM, which is a cutoff motto, which, is, which identifies items which are statistically significant off the scale. Then I, items where the readings are in the top 3% of, of people, the top 6%, top 9%, 12 and 15%. Again, dealing with the issue of, we, we, are, we are looking at individual results, but the data is about average. So what we are trying to do by going down to 15%, there's probably a lot more which we could identify 2025, but what we are doing is identify the ones which are prominent outliers. And as you go down, you can see the list there and there and down the bottom, you see from the other study, which don't, doesn't name the same bacteria, but you can see how the number of matches keeps going up. And it's relatively good impressive number of matches where the study results and her results are matching some cases uh, like these two across the board is a match. And then we hit, hit other things, which when we get up to, uh, this would be 6%, we start getting a whole stack of additional matches. Uh, 9%, we add a bunch more in, 12% a few more, 15% a few more. So I then went and looked at a variety of ways of doing it and ended up putting all the suggestions together. The first part is all about vitamin, all about suggestions from, um, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Gene and Genomics. And then um, I went down and did some spot checks for a couple of things. Like, for example, I said, okay, let's check does iron make a positive effect or not? And what I'm doing is iron was suggested by the cake thing. Okay. Now, that's one set of data to make suggestions from. The other set of suggestions is to look at what clinical studies have shown causes iron to shift. So let's look at those clinical studies and see what causes iron to shift and which bacteria shifts. Now, is the net result positive or negative? In this case, iron came out to be positive. Even though it may not have been shown on suggestion, it's computed to be in all likelihood, as I says, a quick net benefit estimate, a positive one, in which case definitely everything suggests that iron is a good one. And then I did my usual declaration at the bottom about this as being a model, not a protocol, because somebody else with COVID can come in and this may have absolutely no benefit. This person may help benefit at all. And the reason it is unique is because it's all determined by the person's actual microbiome and every microbiome is different. Which means this is a total pain for a doctor to try to apply in the office. Because yeah, absolutely. there's not a cookbook recipe, which is what they were trained to do. They, oh, this is what you do for A, this is what you do for B, this is what you do for C. In fact, try doing a clinical a trial with it when, uh, you're saying, okay, basically, I, I'm going to decide in making suggestions and all overall, so this the patients improve, okay? Uh, you could have problems selling that to any journal because it just sort of, it is outside the normal method. I know what the normal method is. I have a master's in statistics. I work at, with um, medical professionals for a while doing medical studies. I know exactly what the performa correct way of doing things are. And when those methods fail, I started looking creatively at other approaches from data science and ended up doing that. Okay, now if it's amenable to you, I'll switch over to, um, so just a quick PowerPoint about post-infection syndrome, which covers a whole variety, I think, it's something which has been known in the medical circle for a fair number of years, but it has largely been left ignored or people who care about being frustrated because it's been obtuse or confusing to deal with. Um, historically, individuals were typically individuals, and the problem could often be ascribed to just from or nothing. You're a doctor, you're treating somebody, disease is fixed, but the person still isn't retired. He has no clue or part of oh, just give it time, give it rest, etc. cetera. Um, and when you're dealing with an individual patient, 
the doctor has no ability to see patterns or to investigate patterns, in which case, basically, oh, don't worry, everything will be okay, um, because the world can't say anything else. In the last century, we have had clusters of them. No explanation of cause, but are is on the radar and cited in the literature. The first case I could identify was 1928 with this occult rickettsia. Um, down the bottom of the page is a link to it. Um, a Charles Nicole, a Nobel Prize winner, identified actually developed treatment for it based on the assumption that it was an occult rickettsia. Uh, that is one which did not show up in blood tests, but it was still present. Um, it's surprisingly close to the right approach. The, the catch is infection isn't there. The microbiome shift is there, but the same treatment as using for the rickettsia with variations corrected the microbiome without them being aware of the microbiome existing. It's sort of, person definitely deserves the Nobel Prize he got for something else, but part of his discovery was this. In 1948, the acute disease, sometimes called Isanti disease or um, never a fancy name. And that basically ar arose apparently from a novel infection to Icelanders brought in by American troops during the occupation during the war, uh, wherein the US Marines invaded Iceland. Um, literally, they, in one of the old versions of the US Marine anthem, it actually makes mention of it. And they actually went in and invaded Iceland before Pearl Harbor, which is just an interesting historical note. Interesting, I didn't know that. Okay, 1955, World Free Hospital, which is where the first use of the common ME term came in. Um, and then there are many, many more down the bottom. I gave a link to where you get a long list of other cluster of um, infections where post-infection syndrome was noted in the group. Okay, the 1928, um, the occult rickettsia worked by, by using false ornating antibiotic. Cecile Sardine, whose father works, worked in the Pasteur Institute of Tropical Medicine with the Nobel Prize winner, um, recognized a symptom in a friend who had chronic fatigue syndrome. I said, wait a minute, I know this. I know this because I saw it. She happens to be a surgeon. She's not a, one who treats infectious diseases. So she tried her um, father's method, uh, method her father used with her, with a few patients. They worked and in fact, she reported something like 80% remission rate with wow. a sample of over 2000. Um, it was alternating microbiome antibiotics, so not the same antibiotics, and it was false. So it was just antibiotics for 10 days, two weeks off, never antibiotic for 10 days, a third one for 10 days. And if you, one of the things I did once upon a time was I went down after the next report in 1999, there were reported symptom microbiome seats, seeing in MECFS patients from Australia, all publication reported similar. But what I did was I took the 1999 report, went over and looked at the antibiotics Zardine was using. And lo and behold, I found an interesting thing. The ones that were high, the antibiotics being used reduced those. The ones which were low, however, they had no impact at all, were ineffective against, or in some cases actually encouraged. So it was sort of saying, wait a minute, the Australian shifts and the antibiotic protocol seem to line up very close to each other as a logical model. In other words, one and the other. Although it was for the 1999, I read it. It wasn't until 10 years later that I paid attention to it with a, in a relapse. And the reason I paid attention to it was I was controlling all my other symptoms except for um, one characteristic, which was the gut microbiome. I, I got the terms, which I never had before. So that caused me, in whenever I come down with a MACFS fair, I literally reread every PubMed article on the update. And there's quite a number there to see if I've missed something. In this case, I missed the microbiome aspect. It now explained that, and that helped the rationale with getting my natural path, prescribing the same set of antibiotics again. Um, 2020, microbiome shift reported with active COVID, which I just covered. And 21 is where shift persisting after recovery, testing 30 plus days, individual sample shows increased the function over time. One of the, the patient had two samples after long COVID, and in this case, some of the dysfunction actually increased from, her or, from the earlier sample to the later sample, which was interesting to observe. And as we will see shortly, prior studies actually confirm it with a different infection. Okay, and the Bergen model is something I've written about on my blog site because when I came across it, it I sort of said, okay, wait a minute. We have an unusual case here. 
we had the major outbreak of a disease. It's a bacterial infection. Um, everybody was on a national medical system. Joy, we had consistency of records. We could, our researchers could go in and see everybody in the household. And it was not having to get permissions consent. They just could go in and do it. And there was follow up the patient year after year. Same medical, same system, same records there. And what we found is that one third experienced symptoms after initial treatment. In other words, basically one third people had post-infection syndrome. Interesting thing is one third is roughly the ratio of people with COVID who become non-COVID tolerance. Interesting coincidence. Um, after two years, IBS and CFS was reported in 46% of these post-infection people. Not everybody, but just the post-infection people. With. The recovery rate for IBS and CFS all show some recovery over time. Here we're thinking that is a little bit interesting. They, they, they use a strict criteria for CFS and for IBS. And for CFS, you can see between one and 3%, 60% still retained matching the criteria. After three years, it dropped to 46%, five years to 41%, Six years, 30%, 10 years, 26%. After 10 years, I have suspicion the recovery rate is going to be very slow afterwards. Uh, it, the curve is just sort of feels like it's a flattening curve downwards, which is beautiful. Remember that it is a, using FUTIMA criteria. That does not mean symptomless. It simply means enough has improved that they don't meet the criteria anymore, which is, a, which, which is a, for research purposes, a German criteria doesn't mean that people are not without symptoms. For IBS, we have the Rome 2 criteria being used. And here we have something interesting. 43% had IBS after one year. After three years, 46% had it. In other words, percentage with IBS that meet the criteria went up. After five years, it went up even more to 59%. Finally, by six years, it started coming down to 39 percent after 10 years, 40%. In other words, the IBS persisted onwards much longer than the CFS symptoms does. It's interesting because on with IBS, one could assume that the microbiome dysfunction continued and stabilized towards IBS. And in terms of the microbiome function supporting CFS, it simply kept diminishing. So it's an interesting character. It means potentially every long haul COVID person if left untreated or left to conventional treatment, has about a 40% chance of getting IBS, so one third and 40%, um, which means about 12 to 15% of every COVID patient will end up with IBS as a prediction. Okay, and let's look at something. I've been on the long haul COVID list and seeing all the people jumping in and out saying, oh, just anybody else has just symptoms, anybody else has just symptoms. I had a few years back um, put together a large list of symptoms seen and links to it that's like on my um, it, on my CFS remission website. And what we have is here, as far as I could compute from the existing studies for CFS MLE, is what we see magnesium, magnesium deficiency, which was one of the issues which the um, long call long call COVID higher which was pointed out um, from the cake enzyme study, which was interesting. 45-50% um, of CFS patients have it. Not surprising that one of the long haulers had it. Very expected. CoQ10 is low in 45%. Here is something interesting. High level of cyclokines in 60% of patients only, 40% do not have high levels of the typical one. Cortisol is low in 33%. <coughs> the heart becomes physically smaller in 61%. Having a smaller heart is going to affect energy levels and ability to do things. Iron, remember we, we saw in our patient example, iron being low, 69% were, were insufficient or deficient. Again, a lovely matchup between long haul COVID and MECFS findings. MRIs or hit to miss for showing abnormalities and about somewhere between 27 and 32% had abnormal scans. PET had about 50% with abnormal scan. Um, SPEC had 80 to 80% with abnormal scan. In other words, if somebody's going in for a scan, they should really, really press for a SPEC scan. And generally, I've had one myself, and generally what it will show is low level of hyperperfusion, that is oxygen delivery to portions of the brain, which, which of course would cause something called brain fog. 
would affect cognitive function, would affect executive function, all because of the um, low delivery of oxygen to the brain, which would be shown by the spec scan. And let's go on for more symptoms. Shortness of breath, 32%, very common with long COVID holiday. Um, the survey on effort, rapid heartbeat or tachycardia. Hey, on case study, I have that. Chest pain, very common. Um, fainting, ultimate dizziness, coldness of feet, which, which indicates a blood circulation problem, usually. Hypertension was occasionally, you no know, 28% chance. Electrocardia with slight right axis deviation, 21%. Severe sinus arrhythmia, 34%. Small heat, heart shadow, cardiac, um, about 6% of patients, low heart stroke volume, 36%, all of these would impact their energy level. And then we come to something which is real interesting is reactivation of our infection. Why does this occur? Well, if you think about how many enzymes were stopping produced, the body immune system controlling prior infection, often infections are not eliminated. They're simply controlled by the body immune system, especially things like Epstein-Barr or um, chicken pox, which will cause um, shingles later in life if there's a reactivation happening. So why reactivation happen is very logical. It is because the metabolites to the immune system are jacked and the immune system is not able to continue suppressing uh, prior infection. And what do we find? Q fever, 17%. Ross River fever, 24%. Epstein Barr, 20, 23, 27, or 57%. And that partially depends on the population that's being measured on. Mycoplasma issues, 50, 52, 59%. Mycoplasma infections resurfaces, 83C, 31%. All of these are reactivation, and of course, probably going to be even more virus reactivation, depending on where in the world you are and what type of viruses are seen. Okay, now, what we're seeing is this massive number of uh, Symptoms, we have just massive number of viral reactivation, each one, many of which may require specific antivirals to treat. So we end up with a immediately complicated treatment thing. So first thing is KISS, keep it simple scientist. Um, I decided to do a prayer phrase for politeness sake. If we assume the specific shift of some bacteria causes certain symptoms, Different symptoms means different shift of a subset of bacteria, keyword, a subset of bacteria. And there's a whole bunch of different subsets which have been altered. COVID from China has found certain bacteria correlates with severity of some symptoms, which means that that seems to confirm our basic model. Key thing to understand, and this is something which almost can be a challenge of thinking for many even natural paths or medical professional, it is not one bacteria that causes all, which is traditional medical view. We treat each smallpox, we have measles, we have cough, we have um, whatever, almost all ascribed to one bacteria or one virus. Now, that's not the case. Welcome to a whole new, more complicated world. We're talking about shifts of dozens of bacteria. If you refer back to, remember from the studies I showed you, something like 38 or 42 major shifts, which was physically significant. Now you've got 42 shifts you need to correct. Not just one, and now you end up having an interesting case. What the model does do is lead immediately to a treatment approach. First of all, we use 16S microbiome analysis to determine the shift the person has, reference it to normal population, or in this case, long haul COVID pop population. And so that we can filter out um, shifts that may be caused to other conditions the person has. For example, if the person has asthma, there's a set of microbiome shifts associated with asthma. Um, if they have high cholesterol, they never shift. All we want to do is not solve the world's problem. We want to do is treat only long haul COVID or whatever specific condition we're doing. We want to focus in on the bacteria, which seems to be the likely candidates for causing it. And that is simply so that we don't get overwhelmed with complexity. And, how, uh, and once we determine the shifts, then we want to change the shifts. And we change shift by diet, supplements, and drugs to alter the shift. Well, conceptually, easy done. Okay, walk in the doctor's office. Okay, now I want to decrease this bacteria, increase this bacteria, decrease this in bacteria, in, in, increase this bacteria. And the doctor is going to look at you and say, huh? He, he's going to be a deer in the headlights. He's not going to have any idea where to start. He may go and say, okay, oh, this one, I know how to create. You take this antibiotic for this particular thing. Okay, well, that antibiotic may make every one of the other 37 shifts worst. That's where the problem comes in. You cannot treat it at, at a single bacteria-bacteria approach. Microbiomeprescription.com 
right now is your last great hope. Um, it's the best out there. There's, if there's something else you could refer people to, I'd rather refer them to it, literally. Um, just this hobby thing I do in the evenings, etc. It's pretty time consuming and I really try to avoid people asking for help because I really don't have the bandwidth. I have two people in the family with significant health issues. I work full time. So really I'm trying not to encourage thing. I'm trying to maintain the site and let people teach themselves or refer them to other professional. It was originally developed for MEC investigation and then expanded for all microbiome dysfunction. I developed it in one sense for myself for the next time it happened. And actually the next time it did happen, which was a very minor relapse, it proved extremely helpful. I harvest thousands of facts on what changes which bacteria in which direction. All sources from PubMed, I just did a count. I have 1,045,138 facts in the database, which are facts saying, this changes that, this changes that, this changes that. We have lots of bacteria. We have lots of different substances out there. And we have some lots of complexity. And what it does, it applies fussy logic and AI techniques. I have worked professionally in AI, including for Amazon, and to try to deal with contradictory issues to come out with a, um, with the best recommendations I can derive from it. And, but the recommendations, if you are a professional using it and you have professional access to the website, will actually give you a full evidential, tra um, evidential trail for why things happen. And probably I should show that next. Okay, and that's it. So I'm going to go and change screens to, do you see my combined prescription now? Okay, I'm going to do a log on and I'm going to make use of the lovely friends over at the Biome site who have been, I've been working with because they have wanted to work with and they've been cooperative both ways. So I've been helping them, they've been helping me. And I'm going to the example login. The reason I'm going to example login is that it has professional settings on it because it's intended to allow people to, um, or professional see what's there without having to upload the data so they get a feel before. So I'm going to go down here and I'm just going to grab one. I'm going to go to advanced suggestions and I'm going to just go down and click this little magic feature called show links to study use for suggestion because it will do something. I'm just going to go through and click that. And now there's a whole bunch of suggestions for this particular person. But over here, you notice this little book citation. For example, if I go down here at number one suggestion is there, I click this. And now it shows what is impacted, what is being impacted by, and gives all and gives the um, citation where the data is coming from. You notice we have bacterial volcanoes in one thing, we have Drusella as another, um, and Acrococcus as another. So the rank in the previous page is a, not for what will work best but it is based on the confidence of it causing a change. And that is based on the number of bacteria positively impacted. And basically saying, okay, in this case, probably all six of them were positively impacted, which were in scope. On other bacteria, you will see, and let's see if we can hopefully find one like that. Um, let's, oh, let's pick an iron. And it will show small, small, and some cases they'll be contradictory. So because it's contradictory, it's given a lower impact and there's a weighing for how much shift of a particular is, need, is one you'd be corrected for. So if something has a severe shift in one direction and a small shift in the other. So it, it reduces the high, but increases the low, then it's gonna be given a higher confidence level simply because it's less likely to have an adverse impact. So it's all flying by the seats of your pants, if you will, mainly because we don't have any more accurate way. But for a medical professional, if you want, if you're working with a patient, you want to go and say, okay, why is this particular probiotic recommended? They click through and you see particular. There's exactly one here is recommended, decrease the lactococcus. Uh, so something with a value, value of what was it? Um, 2.19, or there's about all of these probably are single citations against one bacteria only in the collection of them. So in other words, you can go through and somebody can go and verify the basis of every suggestion. This is what I call open data source. No questions as, so everything of how I make the suggestion 
is there. All the studies are linked there. And you can go and use this to provide a list of suggestions and then hand check every suggestion if you have any concern, which means, okay, now I know. And remember, positive and negative are listed and factor into the confidence. So that's a characteristic which I um, have valued highly on the side is the openness of the data. And where you see this little symbol is I've gone and dealt with a common problem, which is often individuals have a tendency to do um, um, what's it? I'm trying to remember the, the term. Um, homo, right, homeopathic dosages. They go and say, oh, I take vitamin D. I don't need any more. And you inquire and you find they have 100 IUs of vitamin D and the multi, multi vitamin they're doing, which is actually nowadays below the recommended daily amount. So what I've done is I tried to go over and identify wherever a substance has been used in a study and link to the study so you can see where it's used. And you can now go and say, okay, so this one is using 1,050 milligrams per day. Are you sure I didn't do a typo? Click here. And what we have there is was used in study there. And you can go and click here and you have the full article there sitting for you. So you have the sweet situation of complete data source exposure from top down. So and I try as much as is possible to have every source available in full text so that people have no ambiguity. And sometimes the summaries are, are crisp. Some of my sweetest finds, particularly for antibiotics and prescription drug, was a short four page study which had a beautiful appendix. And the appendix was Excel spreadsheet, which was massive. And I inhaled all of the data into the database. So often you have to dig to get the top. So, okay, at this point in time, I'll just stop the share. And that's just if you want, want it specifically for me to take a look at. No, I think that was great, yeah. So we're back to seeing each other's faces. We're back. Um, so that basically gives a synopsis of long haul COVID, how I did analysis. Timing was good, I mean good, because the study had just come out less than a month before the person asked. I'd been looking for it. When the person asked, I went, and then I could my draw literally dropped saying, wait, what? wait, wait a minute, this is exactly what's been praying for. I wasn't expecting to happen for years. It was a beautiful mm -hmm. population who had microbiome done before COVID. They had COVID. 38 days later, analysis done, comparison, pre and post. Sweet. Do you know how long you would wait for such a thing to happen in, in the US or anywhere else in the world? Yeah. Thank you, China. Your interest in the microbiome is so, so appreciated. And unfortunately, some of the sweetest probiotics I have found in my studies are Chinese probiotic antibiotics available in China only, which is unfortunate. If somebody feels like being entrepreneur of important results, they provide they don't run into regulatory problems with the importation. Yeah, uh, like a super perfect study to come across. Yeah, um, but so that's it. Um, so that's basically it. Um, site is there. It is overwhelming for amount of data. I've tried keeping it reasonably structured. Um, put some for brain fog things. For example, there is a link for brain fog MECFS people. If you stick in, upload the thing, click that, and it will give suggestions at the level of comprehension, which is they're likely to do. Um, I, do I do videos regularly on it. Um, and the whole on different aspect when I add, constantly adding new features. And usually every month I review every possible PubMed article which shows impact on bacteria, which is a fair number of evenings every month to do, but it means the database is constantly updated, which is sweet because you're always dealing with latest studies rather than, um, for example, many labs I've gone in and looked at People have formerly their lab results and go on and see their literature citation. And the latest one was done 11 years ago. As in, last time they checked medical literature was 11 years ago. So, of course, you could have a high confidence that their suggestions are current. Mm -hmm. So, that's basically it. It is a tool which I know some professionals are using. Um, and other, the more advanced human, more advanced patients are being using. And in general, in terms of the feedback, I've gotten good feedback. Okay, some people say, okay, I tried this. It didn't work, it made it worse. I stopped it, went on to something else, I knew this, and it improved. 
Yeah. Again, think... again, it's a model. All it does is short lists suggestions, which has a increased probability of being benefits. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to really dig this episode. And I think that I would really suggest anybody who has had issues with COVID um, post-infection, uh, take a look at your microbiome, see what kind of shifts you may have had, um, you know, and upload it to the website. It's free after all. Um, of course, giving a, a little extra donation, I think would be greatly appreciated by Ken. The amount of hours he's put into this is phenomenal. Um, so I really suggest people to do that. And I think it'd be great to get more uploads onto the website so that we can start seeing, you know, comparing it to studies like you just found um, and seeing if there really is quite a, uh, a trend that we can compare on a, on a larger on a larger basis of um, patients. So I think that would be really cool to see. Um, and I appreciate your time today. I'll make sure to link everything we may be discussed uh, down in the description for people to look at. Um, if there's any final words you'd like to share. Um, you know, make use of the website. It's overwhelming. Um, don't be afraid to share the website with the doctor. I expect to be uh, massively ignored. But um, the catch is everything is up to what I call the highest standard of medical thing. Everything is coming from National Library of Medicine. Well, it's not something you heard on the internet or the grapevine. It is all based on studies. It links to the studies. Why things happen is all very much apart from the citizen science component in it, which is um, not at, which is sort of machine learning stuff, which is more, which is not involved generally in terms of recommendation, but basically it attempts to solve the, the, the treatment problem. So at least you have a treatment. One common thing people have mentioned is, do you know, I was getting so depressed until I discovered your site, tried it, and suddenly I, or in some cases, I know a particular child turn around within three days, in this particular case, it was a child starting to take um, NIM supplements. Mm -hmm. And that just changed them around. And now I have hope because although something may not work, I have a trust that this model or this approach does, and it's not, okay, try this antibiotic, oh, that's oh, sorry, nothing to do. It's almost an endless depth of model, which means you won't run out of suggestions. There's no need to despair. You have, and the key is, which I did with my last MECFS remission, is I ended up doing eight samples over about six months. And every time I did a sample, it generated a different set of suggestions, which I implemented. To the next sample, microbiome shift changed. The shifts were different, the suggestions were different. So it becomes an iterative stage. So it's not going from long COVID back to health in one single step. It literally is a multiple process. Uh, in mathematics, it's a Markovian chain, which is how you end up getting it. For example, with the um, Bergen people, you saw that you had CFS, IBS, but then things shift over time. Each shift is a ch change in position in a Markovian matrix until after so many years, you have basically high probability of chronic IBS. To undo it means you can't go all the way back. You have to unwind each set of different sets of shifts, and then you will have a good chance of getting, like me, back to normal, healthy, functioning life. Yeah, it's incredible. Well, thank you so much for your time. 